He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I am so glad you joined for our lesson because it is about Easter. It's about how everyone felt on Friday, so hopeless and dismal and so totally unexpected what happened. And then today, the joy and the feeling of hope is what today's lesson is all about. It is titled, Death Defeated, and it's from the book of John, chapter 20. And our first section is chapter 20, verse 1 to 10. Before we begin, let's go into prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you and praise you for this glorious day. Thank you for the hope that you have given us. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and all that he did for us by going to the cross. And I just pray for your Holy Spirit to help each and every one of us to understand what you truly want us to know and how we can not only put it in our hearts, but how we can live it out. I just want to thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our first section is titled Evidence at the Empty Tomb, Point It to the Resurrection. And we have to remember Passover week has ended. Um, the horrific events that happened on Good Friday with Jesus hanging on the cross and then dying and how they had to rush so quickly to get him into the tomb. And so they they just did a very quick, you know, some ointments, you know, oils on his body. They quickly wrapped him in grave cloths and they put him in the tomb. Why did they have to rush so? Because it was coming to be Friday night. And that is how or that's the Jewish Sabbath starts from Friday evening to Saturday evening. So they didn't have much time to properly care for the body and do what they were supposed to. So here it is, Sunday morning, three days later, Mary and some other women, which we know there are other women because she uses the plural we when she is talking about this event. And if we read the other gospels, they do name other women along with her. So here are these women coming on very early Sunday morning, probably like six o'clock, and they are going to finish the process. They are planning to ask someone to roll away the stone in front of the tomb so they could go in and properly um, clean the body, dress it, and do it what they should before he's properly um, buried. But as they get there, they're discussing how they can, you know, who's going to roll the stone away? How can we do this? And in one of the Gospels, it says there's like an earthquake and the stone is moved. Well, these women go to where the tomb is and they see that the stone is rolled away and they're like, oh my word, did someone come in and take the body? That's their first thought. Okay. And they, Mary just turned around and ran straight to the disciples. And she told Peter and John, look, the tomb is empty. And in her mind, someone took the body. Well, John and Peter run to the tomb. Now you have to remember, John is outside of the tomb looking in because, you know, maybe he doesn't want to defile himself with the dead body in there. Not sure where it could be. And maybe it's just shock too. But here comes Peter, you know, Peter, who's so overzealous and goes beyond that what he really needs to. He just goes right past John, right to where Jesus's body was laid. Now you have to remember the burial clothes are arranged in a, in a order that you would not have figured. Now the, the, the cloth, the big cloth that Jesus had, you know, think about it. if he would have sat up, it would have just fell to the side. But also when they buried him, they put a face cloth, cloth on him. And John noticed that that face cloth was neatly folded and laid to the side. You know, think about that. that that's unique. Well, <clears throat> when they entered the tomb, they... They didn't quite understand what Jesus was trying to teach them, but they were beginning to. And although Jesus had spoken often of his death, 
and resurrection. It was the absence of his body and the presence of the grave clothes that led them to their belief. Well, how do we apply all this? Have confidence in the truth of the resurrection. Well, what would you have told the disciples if you found the tomb empty? You know, I think I would have been Mary. I would have thought someone stole the body. Um, it could have been the, the Roman government or maybe a group of Jewish people that didn't want to hear about it anymore. That's what I would have thought. How does the presence of the grave clothes and the folded face cloth point to the reality of the resurrection? Well, think about it. If someone actually stole the body, would they have taken the time to neatly fold the face cloth and lay it to the side? I don't think so. Everything would have been in a heap. So that obviously did not happen. Well, here's the next section. Jesus appeared to his followers and sent them to share the good news. Wow. Well, you know, we're not certain when Mary got back to the tomb, but when she got back to the tomb, she was weeping uncontrollably. And in the tomb appeared a heavenly being, an angel, all in white. And usually the white is used to show the holiness and righteousness of God. And she, he says, why are you crying? And she's like, because I don't know where, where they took the Lord. And he said, don't look for the living among the dead. And she's like, what? Uh, you know, you have to realize this is all strange to them. Even though Jesus taught them about it many times, I think just like us, sometimes you have to experience something before you totally understand it. And that, I think, is so true here for Mary. Well, while she's continuing still weeping, even though the angel said that, she turns and she sees a man in the garden. And so she thinks this man is the gardener. So she goes over and she pleads, pleads to him, like, will you please tell me where they took the body of our Lord so I can properly care for it? You know, do you know what happened to him and all? And she did not even realize that was Jesus standing there until he said her name, Mary. And when she recognized that it was him speaking to her, her response was to call him Rabbanai, which means teacher. And she went to embrace him. But he said to her, now look, you know, I'm not totally restored. I need to return to my father. And so Mary was commissioned by Jesus then to go and tell the disciples what she saw and she did when she went and she told the disciples what she saw they they weren't for, at first wasn't sure what to believe because think about it these past couple of days were very emotional you know did she really see what she saw was it something else and also this room that they were in it was locked because they were fearful of retaliation from other jewish groups or from the Roman government, they still did not know what was truly going on. As they were in this room that was locked, they heard, peace be with you. And there in front of them was Jesus. And he told them what he wanted them to do. As they were an eyewitness to him, and they saw him go out into the world, he told them he is also sending them to go out into the world to be witnesses to all that they saw about him. And that was what he said, go and tell people about me so they too can be in heaven with me. Now you have to remember in this room, there were only 10 disciples. Thomas was not there. And Judas by this time has hung himself. But, when Thomas showed up later, they were so full of joy and they were ecstatic and they were telling him, we saw Jesus. And he told us that we need to share about his, him with other people. And he was like, you know, I doubt that. And the thing was, you know, 
he himself wasn't sure. And he said, until I see the physical Jesus in front of me, until I can see his wounds and touch them, I am not going to believe. Well, <clears throat> it comes to this point that, that, that some days pass, okay? And it ends up that Jesus shows up to Thomas. And I think we also have to realize some of this too is some forgiveness here. What's this all about? You know, Jesus is so forgiving and he is so loving, but he also sets a standard for us that we need to follow um, to be kind and caring and um, loving and to accept people as a neighbor, remember to love our neighbor and to treat them as we would be treated. That's what he would like us to do and share his story, tell the gospel. Well, how can we apply all this? Well, share the gospel with all people because Jesus lives. Why are Christians sometimes afraid to share their faith? Well, fear of rejection, fear of being made fun of, um, sometimes we're not sure if we can even answer the questions right, or sometimes we might feel we can't find the right scripture to, to um, support what we're trying to say. I know myself, I feel sometimes I have a very hard time communicating a point, and sometimes I've been told I can get a little preachy. So that's sometimes I think why I might not always share the story easily. Well, how can we be involved in getting the good news of the gospel to all people? Well, first we can pray for those who are lost. And then we can share the gospel ourselves. And we can be involved in our church missions. And we can also give money to send missionaries away. At the end of April, we are going to have two missionaries at our church. And prepare yourself to hear them. They'll be there for Sunday school and for the service. And they will share what they do in the country that they serve in. And that's something you can get interested in. Maybe you can find out a way how to pray for them. Or maybe you can give a little money toward their uh, ministry that they can help share the word of the Lord. <clears throat> well, our next section here is Jesus gave Thomas undeniable evidence. And that's John 20, 24 to 31. Well, like I said, eight days after Thomas said, look, I don't believe, he shows up once again in the room with the door locked. And Thomas was with them. And when Jesus arrived, he allowed Thomas to see and touch his wounds from the cross. For Thomas, the reality of the resurrection changed everything. And he acknowledged Jesus as his Lord and God. Now think about this. Here we have the 10 disciples, well, 11, including Thomas. How did Thomas feel for those eight days? The other 10 saw the Lord and was able to have such joy and astonishment to the whole thing and be able to live that moment and for eight days here's Thomas he knew Jesus he was there for his teachings he kind of wasn't getting it he's kind of he kind of got it I'm sorry but for eight days he didn't fully get it he missed out on that first appearance that blessing and everyone else was living that and he wasn't. He wasn't. He was still held back from his doubts. Well, when he saw that, of course, you know, he no longer doubted. And in verse 29, the Lord pronounced a blessing on all who would later believe without visible or tangible evidence. So he is blessing us today. Back then, he was saying this blessing for us, that those of us who believe without being able to touch his wounds like Thomas did, or being there to see him appear, bless us without that evidence. Well, Thomas was blessed to believe. 
But those of us who believe without seeing the risen Savior are more blessed. John wrote his gospel so people would believe in Christ. And John informed the reader that this was merely a sampling of the works that Jesus did. All that was recorded, however, was written so others would come to believe in Jesus, that through believing, they would experience eternal life that only he can offer. And there is an author today. You can look up his story. His name is Lee Strobel, and he was an atheist, and he was also an investigative journalist and hearing about Christ and everything he thought I am going to set out to prove that this is wrong and he went through a lot of documentation and a, a lot of information and the thing is he became a Christian even though he had such unbelief with his research and what he found as proof and evidence of Christ and who he was he became a Christian. And here is some things that he wrote. And this is from his book for the case for the case of Christ. While the resurrection of Jesus is often debated and doubted, the evidence for it is overwhelming. There are numerous pieces of evidence in support of the bodily resurrection of the Lord. And in his book, The Case for Christ, Lee Strobel presents very strong evidence for the resurrection. So let's consider the following. The first one is this. The disciples died for their beliefs. This is noteworthy when you consider that they had all but abandoned Jesus at the time of his crucifixion. After the resurrection, however, they completely devoted themselves to the gospel message, even to the point of death. The next thing is, skeptics were converted. James, the brother of Jesus, had been a skeptic who rejected Jesus as the Messiah for a number of years. Saul, the persecutor of the church, went from trying to destroy the church to helping to build it. On what basis? The resurrection. The body of Jesus was never produced. Reality is, if the resurrection was a hoax, the only thing that needed to happen to disprove it was to produce the body of Jesus, and it never happened. The empty tomb. Tombs in that day were comprised of a low entrance in front of which a large stone was rolled. While the stone, with the help of gravity, could be rolled over the entrance, moving it away was another story altogether. Not only would this have taken numerous people to move, but at some point, someone through the fear of death or loss of job, would break the silence and share the conspiracy. Of course, this never happened. And the eyewitnesses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 8, records that there were over 500 witnesses to the resurre resurrected Christ, any of them who whom could verify that the Lord was alive. And that is amazing. And that is a great book to read and to see how this Lee, the process that it took him to be converted and to come to know Jesus as his savior. Well, how can we apply all this? Worship and serve our risen savior. Seeing and touching Jesus' wounds convinced Thomas that Jesus had risen from the dead. What evidence gives you confidence that Jesus is risen? My confidence is change in people. When people come to know who Jesus is as their savior and they really take it seriously, the change is unbelievable. And I think sometimes for us in our brokenness, we might find that hard to believe, but it's true. God can change anyone. And that's something that I know I've experienced, and I hope you can experience that too. If we really believe Jesus rose from the dead, how should that affect the way we live? Oh my word, <clears throat> our lives should be so different than what they were before we came to know Jesus. You know, we should spend time with him, we should live for him, we should obey his word and tell others about him. You know, it's so easy just to go through this life and just 
ignore some things. But if you truly accepted Jesus into your heart, the Holy Spirit is there to help you. Use the Holy Spirit to help you to make good decisions and good choices, to be kinder to people, to care for things maybe you might not have cared for before. It's a whole different way of looking. It's you really need to have God with you all day. Just be alert that, you know, ask him for your help, for his help and ask for his guidance. A continuous thing. It's not a once and done. It is a 24-7, 365 days a year for the rest of your life. Okay, to be in the presence of God. Well, with this being said, I just hope and pray you have a wonderful Easter. I hope you take this day and reflect on what Jesus has done for you to, to take it all in. Read parts of the gospel, all four. And like, again, each one has a different part of the story. But when you put that story together, it is amazing. And Jesus also has encouraged his followers to go and share his story. Tell others about the gospel. And that is also what he has told us, to tell others about him, about the gospel. Because he wants no one lost. He wants everyone to be in heaven. And that would be such a glorious day. Well, have a good day. Have a great week. And just please take care of yourselves. And I will see you back here next Sunday.